Welcome to the Jonathan Edwards podcast, a podcast brought to you by the Jonathan Edwards Center at Gateway Seminary. My name is Dr. Chris Wozniacki, and I have the privilege of being the research fellow here at the Jonathan Edwards Center, or as I like to call it, the JEC. For those of you who are unfamiliar with the JEC, it's one of 10 international affiliate centers of the Jonathan Edwards Center at Yale University. Now here at Gateway, we strive to be the educational epicenter for researching the life and works of America's premier theologian out on the West Coast. Uh, How do we do that? Well, we do that by strengthening our existing doctoral programs, by networking with the international scholarly community and churches. And finally, we do it by hosting this podcast. So in these episodes, we get to talk to some premier Jonathan Edwards scholars about their cutting edge work. We'll also get a chance to talk um, and dive into some of Edwards' most famous works. And maybe, and most importantly, we'll get to chat a little bit about why any of this matters. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce to you today's guest, Dr. Christian Cuthbert. Hey, great to be here, awesome. Chris. Awesome. So uh, some of our audience will know who you are, but for those who might not, uh, kind of give us give us who you are. Give us your short bio. Wow. If anyone knows who I am, I'd be a little surprised. Uh, <laughs> I'm uh, Christian Cuthbert. I finished my PhD in Edward Studies under Mark Valeri about six years ago, and I focus on a, um, the uh, life and thought of Jonathan Edwards, specifically through the lens of warfare. Uh, I was an Army Reservist myself and have that window into the world. Um, been involved in a few different projects, uh, finishing up the Jonathan Edwards Study Bible, uh, which Thomas Nelson will be coming out with in about a year and a half. I have my own YouTube channel, Exploring Edwards. Uh, I live in New England about 15 minutes from where Edwards was born, so I get to travel to the various sites and uh, uh, have fun. So thank you to my three dozen subscribers for that. And uh, <laughs> I appreciate uh, the opportunity to talk about Jonathan Edwards because uh, it's, it's just been a joy getting to know a person who has not been alive for nearly 300 years. Wow. Mm-hmm. And you're also a minister, correct? Yeah, I pastor a medium-sized church, at least for New England, in uh, Vernon Rockville Union Church, and uh, um, kind of straddled the same two worlds Edward straddled in mm-hmm. having one foot in the academy and one foot in local church ministry. Yeah. Um, so one of the things that this podcast hopes to do is to introduce people to Edwardsian scholarship. So some of our listeners might be in a place where they're kind of just getting interested in this field of study. And it's actually a pretty big subject, right? You have mm-hmm. historians, theologians, philosophers, literary critics, uh, all sorts of different subspecialties. So tell us a little bit about where your work fits into this field of Edward studies. Yeah. So you know, we've had a conversation about this. Oh yeah. And I know Chris, uh, Chris in the past. <laughs> yeah, I know Chris disagrees with this. So this is, this should be fun. Not that you disagree with this, but this is not your approach. Um, when I talk to academic uh, groups, I classify my research as intellectual history, looking at the impact of religious ideas on how the world was shaped and how the world shapes religious ideology. Uh, That is academic speak for talking about historical theology uh, and the interplay between history and theology. So my research starts with one uh, kind of bedrock assumption that the most fundamental choice any human being will ever make is the theological choice. And in secular academies, that can be fairly controversial. As most secular historians view religion as the product of political circumstance, economic circumstance, social hierarchy, things like that. I kind of flip that upside down. I say, well, no, actually, economics, politics, social, cultural issues are all the outflow of theological ideas. Uh, So when I look at Jonathan Edwards, I look at the theology that informed his actions and how his theology formed other people's actions. So um, we're going to jump into some of your more academic work uh, in a minute, but I should mention, and you already did mention that you have a YouTube channel, Exploring Edwards. Um, You do interviews, you take people on virtual tours. I think it's a pretty cool thing. You even have a video of Ken Minkema, who's the director of the Jonathan Edwards Center, talking all about Edwards' very unique desk. Um, So briefly, tell us why you made the channel, what you hope people will get about it, get out of it, and um, 
briefly because I know you could talk forever about no, this. No, no, I'm uh, why Edwards's desk is uh, is so interesting. Yeah, no, that it, it merits a whole video. It, well, it merits a whole video because of Ken, not the desk. I realize yeah. probably the best thing for my YouTube channel is just following Ken Minkum around and um, taping him talking about Edwards, doing grocery shopping, like whatever he wants to do. Uh, that was a treat. Edwards' desk is in the master's house of Jonathan Edwards College at Yale. I believe Ken is still on the board there. Now, when I moved to New England, I got to visit all these places that Edwards ministered in, studied at, what have you. And being the history nerd I am, I really enjoyed that. And I thought, hey, this would be fun to to put on video. Um, I hope people see that Edwards was a real person. Uh, I go to a lot of burial grounds. I love visiting burial grounds because in my mind, that is a reminder that the historical stories that we read, they're not just stories. They're real people. Uh, they struggled with the same sin that we do. They read the same Bible that we do. They had the same Holy Spirit that we do. Um, and we are both a part of this communion of saints, which Edwards talked about uh, a lot. Well, because the word of God talks about a lot, not just because Edwards talked about it. Uh, and my visiting these sites is just a way to kind of enter Edwards' world and see what's still around from what Ed, from when Edwards was here. And his desk is a part of that. Uh, there's a separate video on the Badger portraits of John and Sarah. And I get to go to New Haven and Northampton and Stockbridge and Boston and a whole bunch of places where Edwards was and filmed either the locations that are still here or in some cases, the locations that used to be there. So hmm. that, I have fun doing it. Uh, I have not yet figured out how to promote it. So at this point, I'm doing it for my own amusement. And if anyone else gets something out of it, I'm fine with that. So That's awesome. Yeah, no, I, it's, it's really interesting to get to see these places and have somebody who knows uh, a thing or two about them kind of explain it. So it's very beneficial. Um, so in front of me, I have an essay, which is a uh, Oh, the book, which is pretty closely related to your most recent book, The Wartime Sermons of Jonathan Edwards. Um, so the the title of your essay in this book, which is the book is Jonathan Edwards within the Enlightenment Controversy Experience and Thought. Um, and your essay is titled More Swiftly Propagating the Gospel, Jonathan Edwards, Colonel John Stoddard and the Invasion of Canada. Uh, our audience can find, uh, yeah, can find this book uh, anywhere books are sold. Uh, it also includes a, an essay written by one of our previous guests, uh, Abby Tyler Todd, and one from me as well. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about this essay. You know, one thing I noticed um, is the context that Edwards found himself in. You know, there's a lot more warfare going on than the standard popular treatments of Edwards tend to show. You know, if you were to pull up some blogs on Jonathan Edwards on Desiring God or Gospel Coalition, you would have no idea that, that he lives in a context where there's warfare. Um, so could you share with our readers what some of the key wars are that's kind of coming right, maybe right in front of him, right behind him, and maybe even during his time and why that's important to keep in mind yeah. um, as this a background? Is what, yeah, this is what makes it hard to write about my subject because nobody knows about the wars going on in and around Edward's day. So I find myself having to tell the story of the wars and it seems like it's only an afterthought of Edward's involvement in it. I don't necessarily see it that way, but if you don't know the context, well, yeah. So the Connecticut river Valley in new England was the front line of a battlefield from uh, really King Philip's war, 1660s, 1670s. You have King William's war in the 1690s. You have Queen Anne's war, the war of Spanish succession from 1698 to 1712, 1713. Those were all wars between, well, not King Philip's War. That was a native you know, British war, but uh, uh, King William's, Queen Anne's started as continental wars between Britain and France, and they spilled over into the colonies. Uh, and it shows us how New England and New France legitimately held onto these identities of old England and old France. Now, in the mid-1720s, uh, we have a cluster of wars, sometimes known as Dummer's War, uh, Greylock's War, Lovell's War, Father Rawls' War. 
And that was New England versus New France, but it did not start as a conflict on the continent. This is just something we took upon ourselves, right? Uh, maybe the most significant military event in the Connecticut River Valley in the first part of the 18th century was the Deerfield Raid of 1704. And that is when a combined French and native force took Deerfield, Massachusetts by surprise, uh, took captive about 112 British people. Um, uh, when they burst into Deerfield, Edward's uncle, Colonel John Stoddard, was uh, a lieutenant in charge of the militia. He leaped out of the second story of Reverend John Williams' house, ran barefoot to Hatfield to raise the alarm. Reverend Williams and his whole family, Edward's cousins, were taken to Quebec captive. Uh, and then Colonel John Stoddard was commissioned in 1713 to join Reverend John Williams to go to Quebec to negotiate the release of these captives. And they brought back only a handful. Uh, Edward's cousin, Eunice Williams, uh, was married to uh, a native and came back to visit during the Great Awakening in the 1740s. And Edwards actually went down to his cousin Stephen Williams' house in uh, Longmeadow, Mass., to, to meet her. The reason why I say this is important is because this is the military event that was burned into the consciousness of the Connecticut River Valley. So anytime war broke out, the feeling in Hampshire County was eventually French and Indians are going to show up on our doorstep cart our children away, marry them off to natives, turn them Catholic. This was the fear. Uh, so anytime a war broke out, this is the pastoral issue Edwards was addressing in his congregation. Mm -hmm. So in 1739, uh, it wasn't Britain versus France, it was Britain versus Spain. Uh, got into it in, uh, in what's called, bizarrely, the War of Jenkins' Ear. Um, and in fall of 1740, uh, Britain tried something new. Britain recruited 3,500 American colonists, and I don't mind calling them American then, uh, to fight alongside um, Admiral Vernon uh, and General Wentworth down in Cartagena. Of the 3,500 people that left the colonies to fight with the British, only a handful came back, right? So this kind of Cartagena in South America. Yes, yes, in Colombia. Okay, so all the way. Okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, it's it's amazing when you read through Edwards' material and the Boston Gazette of this period, how globally aware New England actually was. Boston Gazette has stories of Chinese uprisings in Indonesia and all these events, albeit six to eight months later. But they they were aware of these things. This was uh, this recruiting campaign in fall of 1740 and the actual campaign in spring and summer of 1741 was bubbling up at the same time Whitfield was in New England, whipping up New England into this revivalistic frenzy. Uh, the revivals actually started before Whitfield arrived, but Whitfield really put gas on that fire. So Edwards and most of New England was reading the stories of the War of Jenkins' Ear. Uh, through the lens of what it meant spiritually and religiously. Well, eventually the War of Jenkins' Ear was folded into a broader war, the War of Austrian Succession. And this was, or it actually it turned out to be England versus France. So England's uh, conflict with uh, Spain was just kind of assumed into this larger war with Maria Theresa and the Habsburgs and Frederick II and Prussia and people flip-flopping sides, and it gets involved. Uh, but that war came to the colonies in 1744 as King George's War. And during King George's War, yes, the French and, and Native groups uh, resumed sorties into the Connecticut River Valley, burning Fort Massachusetts, uh, killing Elisha Clark, who is uh, in Southampton, uh, so it, it touched Northampton people uh, who were pretty much on that front line. And after the War of Austrian Succession was kind of resolved in 1748, 1749, there was a brief uh, hiatus of, of uh, conflict before what we call the French and Indian War broke out, which actually started as early as 1753. 
So now Edwards is in Stockbridge, further into the frontier, further uh, towards the front of these battle lines between New England and New France. And from your high school history classes, you might remember uh, General Braddock's defeat at Fort Duquesne. George Washington had to take over after Braddock was mortally wounded and then died. Um, New France at this point was not just in Quebec. They were in Louisiana. And if New France could qu connect their territories in Quebec through Ohio to Louisiana, you have pinned in the British and the French could have shoved us back into the Atlantic Ocean. The French knew this. So after they defeated Braddock at Duquesne, the same regiment marched up to Fort Niagara, uh, where Buffalo is today, Fort Oswego, all the way over towards Albany. And they were met with a British force commanded by Colonel Johnston and uh, I will. Oh, Shirley. Yeah. Uh, former Governor Shirley, now, now General Shirley. And they were defeated September 8th, 1755, in what until World War II was known as the greatest battle in American history, by a combined Native and British force. The Native force was the Stockbridge Mohicans, led by mm -hmm. Colonel Ephraim Williams and pastored by Jonathan Edwards himself. Wow. Uh, so Edwards lived on the frontier of active battle lines most of his life. And... If you read Marsden, he does talk about the wars going on, but it seems almost background, almost landscape. My yeah. research tries to bring the impact of those wars into the forefront. If I can make an analogy, any historian that looks at preaching in the Ukraine over the past couple of years mm -hmm. would not ever think to understand those sermons as sterile presentations of theology but as pastoral, uh, a pastoral framework for their people during a time of war, that's actually a pretty decent analogy to what Edwards was going through, especially from 1740 through 1755, 56. Uh, so because I was a former reservist, I know that warfare can never just fade into the background of your life uh if you're the guy that has to go and fight it at least so yeah yeah so you mentioned um his uncle colonel john stoddard yeah. um does stoddard have an influence on edwards does oh edwards yes have an influence on him like yeah this uh th there's a line from marston's biography that sparked my dissertation my dissertation technically is actually on colonel john stoddard and i use colonel stoddard as a window into edward's life uh, Marsden said, we know Edwards and his uncle, Colonel Stoddard, collaborated, but we don't know to what extent. My project was to try to figure out to what extent. And there is a fascinating reciprocity between Edwards and Stoddard. Stoddard was Edwards' benefactor. He was the, uh, the, the, the guy at the top of the social hierarchy in Northampton probably arranged for his nephew to take over the assistantship from his father, Solomon Stoddard. He negotiated the salary for Jonathan, which is why he was generously paid. Uh, and anytime Jonathan got himself into a spot of trouble with his occasional social awkwardness, he always had his uncle swoop in and make sure that everything was fine. But at the same time, Colonel John Stoddard sat in the third row of the pew of, of Northampton he imbibed Edwards' theological framework through his sermons. And when Stoddard, who was the colonel of the Western militia, he was in charge of the entire defense of the Connecticut River Valley in Western New England. He, I try and demonstrate in my dissertation, he applied Edwards' theology to develop a uniquely American way of making war. So Colonel John Stoddard was a pioneer in using native tactics to fight wars. So in Britain, you usually lined up 10,000 people on one side, 10,000 people on the other side. You marched to about 25 meters away and you shot at each other with smooth bore muskets, uh, not rifles. Smooth bore muskets uh, shoot knuckleballs, so you can't really hit what you aim at. And whichever side gives up first loses, right? 
when Colonel Stoddard started in Deerfield, rose through the ranks under Colonel Partridge, he, he became what we know today as a ranger. He would lead ranging parties across the western frontier to intercept French and Native groups coming down from Crown Point. And he learned from Native Americans, and he developed in, in, in the military what we call an asymmetrical or nonlinear battlefield. Guerrilla warfare is maybe another way to, to talk about it. And it's a way of war that we still conduct, that we have, that America's kind of made its, a, um, its reputation on. And the reason why Colonel Stoddard could do this was not merely out of practicality. Uh, Edwards preached a sermon, uh, April 5th, 1746, uh, Duties of Christians in a Time of War, where Edwards is drawing on this early modern just warfare theory, Hugo Grotius uh, and such, saying that wars must be prosecuted with vigor. That, in other words, if you if you go to war, do what you can to make sure you win as quickly as possible so that there's no unnecessary killing. Edwards actually makes the argument to uphold the sixth commandment, not to murder, that if you let war go on too long, murder will increase. Uh, so it gave theological cover for a soldier like Colonel Stoddard to develop a new way of war, to prosecute with vigor, to bring it to its most swift and complete end. Uh, so, yeah, I could talk about that stuff all, all afternoon. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> So you mentioned a little bit about sort of the theological framework. Um, now, an, an interesting thing about these wars um, is that sort of the theological context that yeah. surrounds uh, some of the motivations. Um, there's a polemic against heathens in Edwards, a polemic against Roman Catholics. How does literal warfare fit into this paradigm of warfare that's going on, you might say, spiritually or yeah. theologically? Edwards didn't see a difference. Like if you look at his history of the works of redemption, Edwards was very clear that the gospel goes forward two ways through, through revival and then through preparatory works, works that prepare for revival. And Edwards documents throughout the Bible how warfare preceded the times of an outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And then he continues with church history, talking about how warfare preceded outpourings of the Holy Spirit, and then he brings it into this present day with this present bloody war. Uh, it's nearly a direct quote, if if I didn't get it just right. Edwards saw the conflict between New France and New England as part of the cosmic battle between uh, Satan and the anti-Christian kingdoms, the Papists, the Catholics, with all apologies to whatever Catholic viewers, listeners you might have here. This is Edwards' words, not mine. And the British Protestant interests, the the championing of Christ and the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. So Edwards thought in order for revival to spread, one had to go to war against anti-Christian kingdoms in order to prepare the way for the gospel to go forward. And he did this in more ways than just his just war theory, more ways than just his, his revivalism. Even the treatises that Edwards wrote when he was in Stockbridge, Edwards thought that he was engaging in an intellectual warfare to tear down uh, notions of deism, Socinianism, Arminianism, tear down notions of heathenism and heresy and heterodoxy, the three H's I talk about. Um, in Edwards' interpretation of Revelation chapter 16, he talks about how there are wars of ideas that have to happen before the gospel can go forward. So Edwards never fired a weapon. He never gave a command from atop a horse, but he really did see himself as a part of this cosmic battle between Christ and the anti-Christian kingdoms. Some people went off for physical war. Some people fought intellectual wars and some people fought spiritual wars. And Edwards was engaged in two, uh, two out of those three. And the third one, through Colonel Stoddard and Colonel Williams and uh, uh, Seth Pomeroy and some of the other officers that were in his congregation. So some of our audience, um, probably most of our audience, will know Edwards' most famous sermons, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God, Heaven is a World of Love, yeah. Divine and Supernatural Light. 
uh, but you bring attention to some sermons in, in this uh, specific essay. And then obviously in your book, which is a book of sermons. With sermons yeah. 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 Um, so like duties of Christians in a time of war, uh, there's a sermon preceding the expedition to Canada, a sermon occasioned by a fast day for the invasion of Canada. Yeah. Um, how common were these, uh, I guess, wartime or war contextual sermons in the New England context? Is he kind of just unique in uh, preaching these kinds of sermons or would he's, you have been able to hear that in most New England churches? Uh, he's not unique, uh, but I think his emphasis is unique. Uh, interestingly, after the improbable victory at Louisburg, where uh, all volunteer force sailed up to the Fortress Louisburg where the French were and, and defeated them, um, Charles Chauncey, Edward's theological opponent, also preaches a sermon talking about God's providence and e extracting the French from, from North America there. Probably the only thing Edwards and Chauncey ever agreed on uh, <laughs> was that uh, there are two different ways that New England sermons talked about warfare. There was the uh, what Harry Stout talks about in his uh, The New England Soul, the occasional sermon. Sermons on specific occasions, usually fast days, Thanksgiving days. And those had a format where warfare was typically a part of that. So for the occasional sermons, that was fairly ubiquitous throughout New England, that they, they would discuss warfare. And they discussed warfare in a particular framework because of the expectations of the Jeremiah, right? I have not exhaustively looked at every sermon preached in this decade, but I think Edwards' emphasis on warfare in three different phases, like in his 40 through 42, uh, Edwards just used warfare imagery as he was preaching revival, right? So as New Englanders were down in Cartagena, Colombia, Edwards is talking about taking heaven as, sol as soldiers take a city, right? But it doesn't go any farther than that. Then from 42 to 44, Edwards starts to identify with this broader Protestant interest. So when Britain won the Battle of Dettingen, another improbable victory, Edwards preaches a sermon in commemoration of that, um, pretty much at the same time that Handel wrote a Te Deum about the same victory. So we have Edwards in the backwoods of Northampton actually doing the same thing in his own you know, particular genre that Handel's doing in London, right? Uh, so 42 to 44, Edwards is signaling Northampton's participating with Britain's imperial Protestant goals. And from 44 on, when warfare came to the Connecticut River Valley, Edwards gets much more specific about... A, a Christian's duties when this happens. How should someone go off to war? How should someone understand war when it visits their home? Uh, things like this. Um, that is unusual in New England, that Edwards would have that emphasis beyond the occasional sermon. It is unusual that warfare becomes a part of this larger framework of Edwards' life. A framework as defined by history of the work of redemption uh, and some of Edward's other theological commitments when it comes to his millennialism and things like that. Um, it's remarkable, no matter how many scholars pick apart Edwards, and, and there is room to do that. I'm not saying there's not room to do that. How amazingly consistent and coherent his thought has been. Uh, so that's what's unique about Edwards. There were other pastors mentioning warfare themes in their sermon, though. So you already mentioned a little bit about what his sermons reveal about his ethics of warfare. Um, what else do these wartime sermons reveal, either ethically or about his theology of war? Um, yeah, well, if, if somebody were to open up these sermons, what would they sort of mine uh, as they were digging through them? Well, I think one thing modern readers would be a little shocked at is Edward's comfort with the idea of war. Uh, pacifism was not a part of at least the American Puritan uh, a tradition, not really a part of the Puritan tradition in general. 
Um, so when you hear pastors today, even ones that are okay with war, preach on war, there's always the tacit acknowledgement that, no, we all know war shouldn't exist. But in because of the sinfulness of this world, blah, 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 yeah, there's no hint of that in Edwards. Edwards does kind of come off from time to time as warmongerish. Uh, I don't think he was bloodthirsty. I don't think he was warmongerous. He was under the conviction that warfare was a part of God's plan to bring his history of redemption to its appointed end. So Edwards knew that there will be war and that war is something that is governed by God himself. Um, I think that preaching is more absent today than it should be. This idea that war is not necessarily an aberration of human history, but a part of human history. Hmm. Um, it is connected with his millennialism, uh, especially in regards to Roman Catholicism. So Edwards followed Moses Lohman's uh, millennial scheme to a point. Edwards departs from it at certain points, uh, including the sixth vial. So the fifth vial for Edwards was the Reformation. It's already happened. Mm -hmm. The sixth vial for Edwards uh, was something that was still in the future. Sixth vial talks about the drying up of the river Euphrates. And Edwards talked about this as the drying up of papal resources so that the Protestant world can, can invade, can defeat militarily uh, the Catholic world. Um, so Edwards had a place for warfare in his grand theological scheme, this uh, uh, dissertation concerning the end of the world, the purpose of the world. Edwards found a place for war in there. Uh, and that's somewhat unique today. Yeah. This is actually the second time in, in these podcasts that we've turned to his millennialism. Uh, we had Timothy Tennant on here talking a little bit about oh, hey. his missiology um, and how that is connected to his millennialism, which that actually interweaves with some of the warfare stuff yeah. as well. You can't really uh, separate those things out. Um, so as we kind of wrap up the discussion about the essay specifically, um, why should we care about Edwards's relationship to warfare in the colonies? Um, maybe sort of historically and theologically. Yeah, no, I, I use war for a very interesting purpose. Um, and here's where you and I come at things differently. So in my mind, warfare is a window where we can see who the real Jonathan Edwards is, or at least as I read it, right? A lot of people talk about Edwards as a philosopher, as a theologian, as an exegete, and he absolutely was all those things. And I'm not saying that that's inappropriate. But when I read Edwards, I see Edwards leveraging all those skills for his role as a pastor. That in order to understand the real Edwards, we have to understand him as first and foremost, a pastor who's caring for real people sitting in the congregation, right? So when we look at warfare, we look at how he drew on the philosophy of early modern British world and guys like Hugo Grotius and Shaftesbury and Hutchinson and these guys. So he, he knew his, his philosophy and we see him drawing on his exegesis of revelation and such. And he's drawing on uh, this deep, rich theology to provide his congregation a framework within which they understood warfare. And I think warfare is just one of many examples where this comes to light. So I hope I never communicate by my scholarship that, like, if you want to know the real Edwards, look at warfare. Now, warfare is an example of this. And to be honest, I stole this from my doctoral advisor. Mark Valeri has looked at Edwards, a, um, uh, Edwards economics uh, as a window into showing how he drew on uh, scholastic thoughts and enlightenment thoughts and this Puritan tradition, this pietistic tradition um, in order to serve his people. So for me, warfare is a window into Edwards. It is not the whole of Edwards. And uh, I'll be honest, sometimes maybe it is fair to accuse me of making more of that than, than, than what I just <laughs> said right there. But uh, uh, I think it's important because it shows us, gives us a window into the real Edwards, the Edwards that cared for his people and wanted to see his people 
connected with what God is doing globally. Uh, and that is, um, that is, is wonderful. And I hope I don't overstep my bounds in saying this, uh, the diversity of the, uh, Edwards center, both at gateway and other places, it's Edwards prayers come to be answered. I mean, Chris is, is Asian. Edwards would have loved the idea that there's an Asian guy in charge of an Edwards center about mm. his, uh, you, you know, you, you have a Hispanic background. Yep. Yep. Edwards would have loved that. I mean, this is Edwards dream come true. Uh, so yeah, that is why I think warfare is helpful because it gives us a window into in Edwards. That's not just a philosopher, a theologian or, or an exegete. Yeah. Um, that's an excellent uh, transition point. So um, he's a pastor, right? Edwards is a pastor who's doing these other things, theology, philosophy, exegesis. Um, we probably want to separate those things out even more clearly than, than he might. Um, but can you speak as a pastor of a congregation um, to the seminary students who might be in our audience? Uh, what have you gleaned from Edwards on this topic for you as a pastor, not just as intellectual history, but is there anything um, that you've taken away from him? Yeah. On this topic. Yeah. I'm afraid what I take. And away it's not, it's okay. No, no, <laughs> I've, I've given it a lot of thought. Um, I, I'm just afraid what I have gleaned out of it is uh, less than popular these days. So as far as me sharing pastoral wisdom to MDiv students at gateway, uh, I can preface it by saying, that uh, I, I think I'm right about this. But if, if you want to make your time in ministry even harder than it al already is, then uh, adopt what I'm about to say, right? <laughs> um, Edwards was captivated by the beauty and the power and the majesty of God, right? That was the thing that seems like it drove Edwards. And truthfully, I get excited about God reading Edwards for me. Um, in, in Edwards introduction to his freedom of the will, he said, I, I, I never believed anything John Calvin said just because John Calvin said it. And I think I could say the same thing of Jonathan Edwards. I never believe anything Edwards said just because it was Edwards who said it. Mm -hmm. Edwards wanted us to fall in love with God through his sermons, through his treatises and all that. Edwards looked at warfare as just a tiny cog in God's history of redemption, a tiny cog in this machine where God is bringing all things to his appointed end. And that has sustained me and, dri and driven me as a pastor. The hard part comes when you turn to your people and you try and instill the same love for God's beauty, love for God himself. You know, there's a lot of people in this world that want the love of God and the peace of God and the joy of God and the security that only God can give the purpose only God can give. So a lot of people that want the benefits God gives, but are not really all that interested in the God himself who gives them. Right. Mm -hmm. Edwards understood when you have Jesus himself, you have all the love, the joy, the peace, the security that you could ever handle. In other words, God is not a means to an end. He is the end in itself. And that's the message that becomes unpopular because as a pastor, I don't look at how many people are coming or what the offering. Is. I mean, yeah, those are not irrelevant things. I do look at them and consider them a, a, a signpost, but that's not the goal. The goal is that couple right there. How, how well do they understand the beauty and majesty of God? And what is my role in getting them to understand that and putting that to work in this family? I mean, that's a different way to approach a local church than simply as an organization that, you know, where you can put butts in the seats and, and such. Mm -hmm. So there are many occasions as a pastor where someone comes to me with an issue and I approach it from this love of God in and of himself angle and not necessarily how does this impact my offering or my volunteers and all that. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's wrong to think about the practical concerns. Although truthfully, I 
I should not use the word practical there because I think a love for God in and of himself is the most practical thing anyone could ever do. So by implying that there are, I joke around with some of my practical theology friends. I say, there's no such thing as practical theology. You know, the Bible says (laughs) all scriptures, God breathed and is useful. Like it's all practical. Mm Say that this is practical and this is academic is not how the apostles thought of it. It's not how Edwards thought of it. We separate things out into philosophy and theology and all that because we are not as smart as Edwards and we have to (laughs) reduce it to things uh, that are a little bit more manageable for us. Um, yeah. So, yeah, pastorally speaking, that is some of the most unpopular uh, input you will ever receive, but uh, important nonetheless. Yeah. So um, on this podcast, we sometimes talk about critical charity. You know, we want to be charitable with figures from the past, but not necessarily uncritical, as you, yeah. you mentioned that uh, the quote from Edwards and how he takes the the writings of Calvin. Um And obviously we're not trying to engage in hagiography either. So is there anything on this specific topic of Edwards and warfare um, where you think maybe Edwards was wrong on this or theologically he was off in his emphasis? Oh, yeah. Yeah, no, that's funny. Um, Well, I go to Hebrews 13.7 for this critical charity or charitable critique, whichever you want to do it. Uh, Remember those who spoke the word of God to you, consider their ways and imitate their life. In other words, the Bible commands us to remember people like Edwards, but not to take what he's said or did uncritically. We are to consider before we imitate, followed by the more famous verse, for Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Interestingly, the things I write about Edwards are probably the things I disagree the most with about Edwards. Uh, uh, Broad strokes, his millennialism, sure, God is working all things to his appointed end, 100% on board with that. The way he gets there, though, with this Moses Lomanesque uh, eschatology, yeah, no, no, I'm not on board with that. Uh, I, as a former reservist, I'm, I'm, I recognize that there are I almost said I'm all for war. That's not quite accurate. I recognize there is a need for warfare in uh, human history. Um, But I think my just war theory would be a little bit more limited than Edwards because uh, I don't, I'm a little bit more critical in of myself concerning how much of God's plan we can know and how he's bringing about his appointed Mm -hmm. end. Um. So, yeah, in the Jonathan Edwards Study Bible, I was in charge of doing the notes for for the book of Revelation. And, yeah, I disagreed with probably 80 percent of it, even though academically it was fascinating. Um, uh, I'm also engaged in some interesting conversations and I'm not fully squared away on this. I don't know if it's fair to paint Edwards as a postmillennialist. He does have some resonance with what would later become known as postmillennialism, but to call him a postmillennialist is reading a 19th, early 20th century definition back into an 18th century figure in a way that I think would be unfamiliar to Edwards. But I do think there is enough parallel between postmillennialism and Edwards' work where I might shy away from that. Um, Mm -hmm. So... Yeah, for whatever reason, I happen to research and write in one of the few areas that I disagree with the most uh, mm. concerning this this man I, I respect. So I appreciate yeah. the question. <laughs> yeah. Um, so one one last question. Um, why should pastors pick up Edwards's warfare sermons? Maybe not even necessarily your book, but, but just his sermons in general, which can be found in your book. Yeah. Well, I was going to say, if you're looking for him in one place, my book's the only place mm-hmm. uh man don't tell my publisher this but i would almost start with <laughs> saying you shouldn't pick up like if you have not read edwards there are plenty of better things to read than his warfare sermons now once you've read those things i'd be curious how people engage the warfare sermons um but i think as far as reading edwards in general Man, I always forget who said this quote. Someone asked a pastor, you know, how do I solve this problem? And his response was, read Edwards, read Edwards, read Edwards. Mm -hmm. Um, As Hebrews 13, 
indicates Edwards was a sinner like us. He had the same Holy Spirit that we do. He read the same scriptures that we do. He faced the same sinful world that we do. Worship the same God that we do. And as a result, Edwards has an ability to speak into our lives in a way that contemporary pastors do not. Like hmm. C.S. Lewis's introduction to Athanasius, he encouraged people to read old books because people who wrote old books didn't write within the same cultural framework, didn't have the same cultural values as us, and didn't unintentionally warp their theology to meet our cultural values in the same way. Now, Lewis says they were still a victim to their own cultural values. They still made mistakes, but not the same mistakes. And mm -hmm. Edwards, I think, is an accessible guy who loved God, who knew the word of God. No one can ever accuse him of being um, shoddy in his academic work, and no one can ever accuse him of being less than pastoral. He holds both of these things together somehow. Uh, so I think he would be important for pastors in general. I think especially American evangelical pastors. Maybe on another podcast, uh, you get into this with someone else. I think you can trace most of the core values of American evangelicalism, be it our biblicism, our missions and all that, back to Edwards. I'm sure my former former professor, Dr. Tennant, shared a little bit about that. Um, so, yeah, I think Edwards can be incredibly valuable, even if you don't start with the warfare sermons, which is perfectly fine with apologies to my publisher. So, <laughs> well, Thank you so much, Christian. Um, thanks for joining us. As we wrap things up, could you share with your audience how they can follow your work uh, on Edwards? I know you mentioned yeah. a couple of things uh, throughout the podcast. Yeah. Um, uh, where can they follow your work? What Maybe what's next for you yeah. uh, in the world of Edwards? Yeah, so um, my Exploring Edwards YouTube channel, you just look up Exploring Edwards and look for the funny looking dude with the uh, Edwards stuff on there. Uh, there's going to be four seasons of that. Two of them are up right now, and I'm working on season three, The Great Awakening Now. I'm finishing up um, the Jonathan Edwards Study Bible Project that uh, Thomas Nelson is planning on publishing summer 2025. And hopefully this will give me room to finish my monograph on Edwards at War, where I do look mm -hmm. at Edwards' thought in a warfare context. I really put the sermon collection together so I could write this other book. Um, mm -hmm. um, so hopefully that will not be too much longer. But when you have a congregation, you don't have the freedom of, a, uh, of uh, putting too hard a deadline on those things. Yeah. So uh, uh, this summer I'm leading, not leading, but helping organize the Jonathan Edwards Tour of New England that Hillsdale College is putting out. So Jerry McDermott, uh, Don Westblade will be a mm -hmm. part of that. And uh, yeah, I look forward to what other adventures I can stumble into. Hopefully with uh, you and Chris and Gateway Seminary, we can do something at some point. So yeah, looking forward to it. Appreciate it. Yeah, that would be awesome. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Christian, and thank you to our audience for listening in. Uh, I invite you to join us on the next episode of the Jonathan Edwards Center podcast. Thank you, sir.